Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. When Amazon pulled the plug on plans to create a second headquarters in Long Island City, the recriminations ricocheted from Albany to City Hall to Seattle and Silicon Valley with dizzying speed. Despite polling that showed strong support from the project for, from, from uh, city residents, including in the neighborhoods that would have been most impacted, loud objections from some activists and local officials were apparently too much for the cyber behemoth owned by the world's richest man. Criticism erupted immediately after Governor Cuomo or Mayor de Blasio, not known for always working so closely together, jointly announced that Amazon had chosen New York, along with Northern Virginia, for its second headquarters. The deal, negotiated in secret, held out the promise of 25,000 new jobs, many of them highly paid on an underutilized plot of land on the East River that was touted as enhancing the city's position as a leader in the emerging tech industry that dominates the future of, global, of the global economy. That uproar over secrecy was compounded when it was revealed that the state and city had offered taxpayer benefits totaling more than $3 billion, though critics left out that the vast majority of those benefits came after the fact tied to the creation of those jobs. Cuomo quickly blamed politicians, not him, of course, but those other politicians, while the mayor took aim at the company. The entire episode revealed the fault lines in any attempt at major development in a city, state, and nation marked by widening inequality, including fears it would exacerbate gentrification at a time when skyrocketing market rate rents are pricing far too many New Yorkers out of their homes, whether they wind up in other locales or homeless on the street. Civic leaders trying to grow the city seem caught between potential developers demanding secrecy and the entrenched system of public review for, for projects that are going to have such a major impact. And it is not lost on anyone that Hudson Yards development received even more in the way of taxpayer subsidies with far less controversy, and Google just announced a major expansion of its footprint in Manhattan without any discretionary subsidies at all. Of course, there was that helipad for Amazon owner Jeff Bezos thrown into the mix, which was a particularly galling piece of fluff that for many exemplified that the rich are not like us. We're joined by four New Yorkers who take part in the debate over the future of this city and whether projects like Amazon are part of the solution or part of the problem. Julie Samuels is the executive director of Tech NYC, which works with companies such as Google, Facebook, Bloomberg, and yes, Amazon, to develop the tech industry in the city. Hope Knight is president of the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation, which has shepherded development in eastern Queens, confronting the same issues of economic development and gentrification. Sigmund Chip is a professor in urban affairs at Hunter College who has studied and taken part in community development efforts. And Harry Siegel is a columnist and senior editor with the Daily Beast and the New York Daily News, who will tell us, who will tell us what it all means. Sigmund, let me start with you. We saw when this project was, you know, when sprung fully formed from the head of Zeus, uh, the community outrage at not being consulted was immense. What kind of a lesson do we take from that? Well, I think um, one of the things to think about is how people have changed over time, how, in fact, they have become more informed, more likely to be irritated by not being included into these uh, forums, um, and that... Um, this issue with Amazon um, really got under the skin of a lot of people and um, led to unusual, in, a, in an unusual way to Amazon saying, we won't come. Um, it's, it was a major decision. It was an unusual decision, very unique. And um, I think uh, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from it. Julie, why did Amazon want to come in the first place? Why, yeah. why New York? Yeah, well, I mean, New York is increasingly a global um, hub for technology, um, if not one of the global hubs for technology. Uh, and, and the fundamentals that attracted Amazon to start actually are still the same fundamentals. We have um, a, a growing base of highly skilled workers, a diverse base of highly skilled workers, particularly compared to a lot of our kind of peer cities, peer regions. Um, we have access to all kinds of industry. If you're a tech company, uh, you know, when you think about it, this kind of last generation of giant tech companies that came up on the West Coast, in many ways, they kind of started in a vacuum without much attention from regulators, without much attention from competitors. You know, those days are done. And now to build, to build a company, you need to be 
around different types of people, around different types of industry. You need access to all of the things that actually just makes New York great. So we increasingly see that tech companies want to be here for access to, I mean, all the things that I think a lot of us love about New York, quite frankly. I hope um, you haven't had to deal with a project the size of Amazon, but you have development that you have to be the broker, you have to be the person bringing everybody together. You have the same pressures of gentrification, the same demands for secrecy or, or proprietary information. It's a balancing act. Uh, people out there obviously watched what happened in Long Island City. What's the reaction? Well, I can't speak for all the people of Jamaica, but I will say that the people that I've talked to were very disappointed. I'm very disappointed. I believe that um, the location of Amazon in Long Island City would have greatly benefited Jamaica. And, um, as and the city at large. And the city at large. And as someone who spent almost two decades revitalizing communities, I know how difficult it is to attract a large employer. Uh, Harry, um, the politics surrounding this project are astonishing. And the kind of, and I, I, you know, I believe it does expose every fault line in the, you know, you know, in this city in terms of uh, you have you have a rising democratic socialist activist community that was that felt blindsided and organized very very quickly, and those were real jobs. So I mean, how do you how did this play out? It played out over a stretch of time where I don't think people change, but the political world changed pretty dramatically. Amazon spent two years in a gangster extractive fashion, pitting cities against each other in a lengthy competition for a HQ2, which is a phrase that doesn't make sense. And then they ended up with two HQ2s that were where everyone thought they were going to go to start with. And you could also sort of predict this by where Bezos has his largest second house, which is in the DC area, and because of the, the talent pool here. Um, in the time when they were going through this process, starting with a huge number of cities and then having a second round of finalists, before going where we knew they were going and then taking it back. Um, we had the IDC wave here, the anti-Trump reaction. I think IDC, Amazon thought- The independent thought, Democratic caucus, the left- Suddenly Democrats, Democrats run New York. For a long time, there were these weird balancing things and that let Cuomo be the essential guy in the middle, which is what he was when he started secretly negotiating this deal. And that changed in the middle of it. So the local political scene changed. Amazon, I think, thought had dodged a bullet because Trump had said some very tough stuff about tech and about Bezos in particular, in part because he owns the Post, but then hadn't done anything. Um, and then when this deal was announced, it wasn't the popular opinion was against it, but everyone who spoke up, who felt strongly vested in the issue in this newly organized group that is plainly to the left of where the center in the city is, and for lots of people who want jobs, was very upset. And crucially, Cuomo did a terrible job selling this, de Blasio did, they didn't think through the mechanics of it, and the places where legislatures had been locked out of the process, or so they had hoped, could say, no, this isn't actually a done deal. And they did nothing to address displacement concerns. So if there are all these good paying jobs, but most of them aren't gonna to go to people who are right there, and you're not saying anything about it, but you're sending mailers around the neighborhood with smiles on them, and talking to, to, to sort of some local kingmakers, but not directly to the people who are the most concerned and the loudest, you're setting yourself up for this defeat. And finally, it was a bit of an accident. So AOC got a lot of credit because she came out as she naturally would very early on, like this is a bad deal, Amazon's a bad thing, not expecting that the deal was going to topple. Well, I actually think AOC's role in this thing is over. Is, vastly, uh, vastly was, overstated, and she was, agrees. Right. But, um, can I push back on one thing, actually? Please. I would, I would, I disagree that people thought they were going to come to New York. People thought they were going to go to D.C. You might have, but the, you know, people I work with in the press, New York was not, we were, some people were surprised we were even in the finalist. Mm -hmm. Um, there was kind of widespread shock about that to some extent. So I think I agree with like a lot of what you said, but I think at the outset, um, New York was not really considered a competitor, but it goes back to your original question, which is why New York? At the end of the day, these tech companies, and we're, I hope we can talk more about this, they're um, really looking to hire people. Like they cannot, you know, they're having a hard time getting their hiring done. And I think once Amazon went out into the rest of the country, they figured out, oh gosh, this is gonna be hard to do in other places. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think that was uh, because it came uh, it came to me as a surprise when I heard that Amazon was considering New York because I had about, heard about other places and then all of a sudden it became a reality that it was going to happen here. So I, I think that that to me emphasizes this nature of secrecy that um, 
that surrounded this whole uh, enterprise. But I can say I used to teach economic development when I first started teaching in 1991 at Hunter, and the same thing was going on. To lure a major employer in, uh, to give uh, tax uh, subsidies, to keep people not involved or aware of the situation. And the thing that really is interesting to me is that we never really are able to do anything different. You know, money is, we can talk about it in terms of it being you know, opportunity cost. So a dollar spent for a, 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 a um, piece of a, a piece or a thing, that same dollar can't be spent for schools, hospitals, good education, which I think are so fundamental, but those things usually get left off the table. And so we give a lot of credence to wanting to create um, full opportunity to help people achieve the American dream, but when it comes down to finding answers to, and solutions to problems that are very fundamental, uh, it just never really happens full blown. I mean, you have to do exactly what Sigmund is talking about. Comes across your desk every day. So, you know, in the economic development work that we do, we're really focused on creating employment opportunities for the local residents, and you have to do that by attracting business. Now, in the life cycle of most economic development activity in underserved communities, you've got to create the residential density first before the companies will come. So, you know, it's a long cycle to be able to get to a point where you can attract a company that is going to have the services that it needs to be located in the community. Uh, but when Sigmund talks about a dollar spent on, you know, a tax dollar that Amazon does not have to pay means that that's one dollar that doesn't have to be, that's not available to, you know, provide some kind of human need. Uh, but those, but those tax dollars wouldn't exist. And now they don't. Uh, right. And now they don't. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> and the, the city dollars in particular were all as of right benefits. The city didn't give anything extra. The state did, but even there, these were dollars that were coming after tax right. uh, uh, revenue had been generated, which is, uh, which is a significant difference. So I don't think that there's any doubt that, one, this was an economic blow for, for New York and, and for Queens, um, and two, that, that New York is a giant place with a large and vital tech industry that can absorb that sort of blow. And let yeah, me know, when Amazon says they're going, and we're actually, we're not going to do HQ2 here. And this is right after its owner has just been involved in this embarrassing blackmail scheme. And there, there are other things going yeah, on. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. D definitely yeah. both. Yeah. Um, big moment for medium. Um, so, so, so even there, they're saying, where are these jobs going to go? And they've got five locations. And one of them is New York. And I'm, I'm going to bet you that we're going to be talking about four or possibly five figures of jobs that Amazon is nonetheless going to be relocating here while, while the land deal part of this is uh, poofed. Right, and we, but, I mean, they had 5,000 employees yeah, already yeah. are committed. But, yeah. but gentrification is not, you know, on the one hand, it's abstract, but it's very real. I mean, the, the, the pressure on land, the driving up of, of the cost of apartments, I mean, that's the kind of thing that a lot in the community, that's not irrational. That's not an irrational concern. Well, well, right, it is an irrational concern. And one of the things that I think we often have to talk about is when we talk about affordable housing, for example, the first thing that comes after that is poor people. But that is sort of um, uh, just a part of the iceberg uh, because it's not just poor people. It's working class people, moderate income people, middle income people like professors who are, in fact, uh, uh, coming up to uh, confronting challenges about providing for the basic needs and needs that come with that with the American dream home ownership etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and so I think we still are not able to we can do deal pretty well with efficiency making profit but when it comes to equity I think we have a real problem trying to directly confront that but you know, is this an example of people making the perfect, the enemy, the good? That, you know, uh, 25,000 jobs 
are 25,000 jobs. And, um, you know, they, they certainly should have done a better job of working with the residents of Queensbridge Houses. I mean, well, were... Queensbridge Houses, though, I mean, you know, a lot of these organizations were actually quite supportive of the deal. And, and in talking to Amazon, I know, too, that um, I think one of the things that happened here is, is they thought, we all thought, many of us thought at the beginning, at least, we had 12 to 18 months ahead of us. Uh, when Amazon first came here and first announced that they were coming, they were excited for the opportunity to dig in and get to know the community and spend that time so that by the time the deal was inked after a year they'd they'd be supporting you know they'd be part of the community now the politics made that difficult but i was on the the community advisory yeah, but you council say that, right but you say the politics made that difficult yeah um the politics is a reality in this city i mean i'm a little shocked i actually um you know the governor went after all the all the elected officials who were speaking up including a state senator from Long Island who had nothing to do with this, and the mayor took dead aim at the company. So, I mean, I, I actually think the mayor was more on point. If, you know, the question is if Amazon could not take the heat in New York, and there is a lot of heat in New York. But, you know, is it that Amazon should have had some people on the ground sooner, a big concentration of people, kind of? Is that the lesson learned here? That's, that's one I of them, one of the hire things. local <laughs> Sherpas and fixers, which they fail to do. But look, this is a company that's been valued at a trillion dollars that makes its money in large part by knowing an awful lot about us. And your options here are either that they are completely inept or trusted a completely inept mayor-governor combination to roll this out, um, or that they are utterly thuggish. And I'd argue it's some of both. And again, I, I want jobs here. I want jobs that generate income and tax revenue and all those things. But when you're a company of that scope and you have a competition, a national competition, pitting cities against each other to decide where you're headquartered, and then weeks after announcing it, you say, actually, never mind, that's a, that's a big, really damning moment. I think that says more about our confidence in tech than other employers' confidence in New York City. It says more, when you say our confidence. That, that it, it provides reason to have doubt in these sort of uh, mega deals and cutting them that way so that there isn't any community input. And this was presented, the perfect is the enemy of the good. We have this deal, it's done. You state senator from Long Island, the whole rest of the state senate, all the lawmakers, the city council, you have no say here. Um, uh, the mechanisms by which you would are gone. Take it or leave it. And do you want to lose all these jobs? And that is a, a sort of crazy game of chicken to play from our politicians who very much wanted those jobs. And the way Amazon responded to that, which again, they're gonna put a bunch of these jobs here, but it's a threat to every other city that if you play hard with us, we are going to damage you. And we're gonna damage you even if we've announced benefits. And that's a very disturbing thing. It's interesting, I don't see it like that. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I see what you're saying, but first of all, as you said also earlier too, the politics had recently shifted in, in, in almost a fundamental way, you know. It, we're in a very different political place than we had been even a couple months before that announcement, like six weeks before that announcement, you know. So I, I do, you know, I don't think it's so simple given the political kind of moment we were living in. Um, but I think even beyond that, you know, from Amazon's perspective, there, you know, you got to, it's hard to put yourself in the shoes of a trillion dollar company. And, but, but if you think for a second, when you are making that kind of investment, and there's a lot of a huge uh, real estate piece of it too, it wasn't just moving people, um, you need some kind of certainty, right? You need some certainty, and you need certainty both with regard to the fact that the deal is actually going to get done, and hope you can probably speak to that better, way better than I can. But I think Amazon was also, you know, looking at a, a culture here of potentially taking on a lot of water for the next you know, decade, you know, a lot of press, a lot of oversight, which is good in many ways, but is also yes, a threat. It's part of who we are. Don't you think that yes. they should have known that the kind of community organizing that goes on in this city is part of life in New York yeah. City? I, th I think also that Amazon came in with this, with, with, with this sort of focus, or it came to be described as, give me everything. You know, this Love is, what, me. This is right. what I want. But I think in a more uh, a because, positive uh, way. Because Northern, because Northern Virginia did not offer the same level of benefit. Well, but their tax, their tax Newark rates. offered so much, much, much more. A lot of other cities offered more. They did not take the maximum offers. And that was part oh, right. of why I think they went where they were going to be going. But I, what, I was, what I was trying to put forth is that why wouldn't they, have, why wouldn't they tout what they could bring, you know, 
uh, improving the schools, improving the roads, improving any number of things to make themselves uh, more attractive and as a, a as a fair player and as a good player in as a neighbor uh, yes and a, as a neighbor um, because they got I don't you know they got cast as someone that was coming in to take as much as I can get and and um, and in addition give me a heliport. Right. What does it tell us about the future of kind of tax benefits in development? I mean, a lot of this is as of right. I mean. How much of that is a factor? I it's, mean, you get more benefits in Jamaica than you would in Manhattan because they, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way the city wants to encourage people to go into underserved neighborhoods. Yes, and, and it's absolutely necessary because, you know, I worked in Harlem for a long time, and it took 20 years into the revitalization to bring major enterprise to Harlem, and it required, you know, reap benefits, real estate incentives for these businesses to locate there. Um, what does it say about the future of tax benefit financing? It's going to be tougher that you're going to have lawmakers who are more aggressive about pushing back on this and have a global, if you will, perspective that they want to fight uh, a, what they see as a race to the bottom. And I think that is going to be a real difficulty in working out the economic incentives that let private developers do things. And by the way, not just with tax benefits, it was also a question of whether construction was going to be unionized and what that was going to cost. Well, it's going to be an open shop or a closed mm -hmm. shop. Mm -hmm. So, and, and so you get into all these questions. You know, look, if all affordable housing is built by, uh, is, is built by, by, by very well-paid labor, you have less affordable housing. There's some natural tensions there. I think having empowered lawmakers who want to argue one side of this, which I have to think is often the wrong side, but having a real argument instead of having all this just happen because most of us have clocked out after Bloomberg's luxury city, his phrase in which people were strongly discouraged from voting or participating in any of this is going to be a healthy development over time. This was a big sort of painful bump in a lot of ways. But yet, lose this many jobs. You know, but. The, now, of course, Hudson Yards went into a place where nobody lived. You know, virtually there were no residents. You didn't have you know, what you had in Long Island City. Which well, the same thing can be said of the High Line. It was, it was a place that didn't really exist until it came into being, yes. But you also have in his, you know, when we talk about gentrification under, and I assume that this is the case, and I apologize if I'm wrong, uh, because of the state involvement in this, um, did de Blasio's mandatory inclusion of affordable housing apply to development in in Long Island City, were there going to be? Because there was a housing component with it as well. I don't think there was a housing component. Not no. for the site that they were going to put. Not for the site. Yes, that's right. right. Which, so, which, 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 which led to a, a considerable um, pushback because most of the housing that was, that was there or likely to be built was touted as being luxury housing. And so, but yet, um, luxury housing development now requires the inclusion of affordable units. Supposedly, yes. So, yes, um, yes, yes. So, if Daily Beast owner Barry Diller is listening, please turn yeah. off. Who's also a patron of the High Line, and as that was being built and developed, when the High Line Park happened, and suddenly all the luxury development was there. And this was mostly going to wired developers who were aware that this was going to be happening, were able to purchase real estate, and some of it was really underused, like parking lots and whatnot, right? But a lot of it wasn't. The city then said this generated $22 billion bajillion dollars in economic development. And in fact, it took the money people were going to use to develop this housing, and it just actually clustered it in this neighborhood. Um, so that, that becomes a form of magical thinking. And I do think that there was some of this around this Amazon deal, that we don't have a trumpeted HQ2 announcement. Once that's happened, that we've lost all these jobs and that New York has put itself behind some eight ball. And I'm just really not convinced that's so. Again, I think a bunch of those jobs are going to end up there. And, um, and, and I hope we do end up gaining that taxable income, putting that into infrastructure and, and, and spreading it around, around the city as tech grows and that, that we squeeze to get... More of that, yeah. but Google, yeah. Yeah. you know, which is near Chelsea, which is near Chelsea Market, has that, you know, is that I think it's an old Port Authority building mm -hmm. actually, um, just announced a major expansion That's right. without any of this hoopla, without any of these benefits, yeah. without any of this controversy. That's right, and I mean, I, well, listen, I think there are. Different is it a, ways is, it a to... is it a cultural difference between the I, two companies? 
Google's been here for a long time. Google started with one guy in an apartment in New York City. Well, Amazon's in Staten Island and has a lot of union problems with its workers as but well. But even, so, I mean, right. Amazon already also has 5,000 mm -hmm. people here. But Google has, I think, grown slowly on the west side. Google, you know, it's, and I guess Google's also part of this too, but it is in incredibly valuable real estate. Real estate, and you know, now they're moving down, farther down Hudson. That's very popular. Didn't they just buy Chelsea Market? They did. Right. Um, and they're supposedly going to be doubling in size over the next 10 years. You know, but what Amazon was talking about was going, it's, a, it's just a different model. You know, Google's going to the part of the city that is um, already pretty developed. Google's been in that part of the city for a long time. They've been neighbors there for a long time. Amazon was talking about 25,000 new jobs at once. And it's, it's just a, di you know, it's a different dynamic. And we have already on the books, you know, we talked about how, at least on the city side, uh, the, all of the incentives were as a right. All of the subsidies were as a right. And a big chunk of those subsidies that are as a right are to bring people to outer boroughs. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's different. And different companies are going to have different opinions on, on how that fits with their culture and where they want to be. And that's fine. But um, we've decided as a city, we want to push people to outer boroughs. Well, that's where the yes. land is. I mean, right. you know, it's also. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, you talked about they didn't have anybody on the ground. They didn't lay any groundwork, which to a degree is an imperial attitude that doesn't show the kind of respect that you know for communities that act that the activist community certainly in the city demands and earns and you know and deserves. So, I mean, uh, what should they have done? Well, I think. And and how do you? balance that with the kind of demand for secrecy. Well, I mean, I think they should have anticipated right away that they needed to have Amazon employees, uh, a group of them, sort of out in the community talking to folks. I don't know if that would have made the difference, but I think it was important for that to have happened. But they also had the situation, if you look at, the, I used to live in Seattle many years ago, where they had these tremendous struggles in Seattle where the city wanted a, uh, I can't remember what kind of a tax it was, but they've had, they've really contributed to the, to the, uh, to the gentrification of Seattle, making a lot of Seattle unaffordable. And when the city tried to capture something back, they basically muscled them into withdrawing it. So, I mean, Amazon comes with its own strong arm, if you will, yeah, I mean, reputation. I, first of all, I think Amazon eventually, I mean, they, they did have people on the ground. They, I think, you know, especially as we got closer to when they pulled out, there was a lot of activity starting to happen, or was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the meetings actually were really good. They were feeling really productive. So it was even more disappointing when, when they pulled out. Um, you know, as far as what happened in Seattle, and I'm not an expert as to what happened in Seattle. I'm not either. But yeah, right. yeah, so I, I might get some <laughs> The premise, you know, I think is, is, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, Amazon has in many ways, listen, tech has grown so incredibly quickly. You've got these companies that are actually pretty young companies in the grand scheme of things, but they're huge. Um, and that's a really interesting dynamic to see. And they're kind of like feeling that out. They're kind of figuring out what it looks like to be such a big company. Amazon's doing a ton in Seattle. Um, you know, they're putting a ton of money into their campus and into the neighborhoods around it and into workforce development and, and kind of really working to bring Seattle along with the company. But I mean, think about Amazon 10 years ago, you know, a totally different thing. And this is, in tech, you know, for many, many reasons, um, some of them right and some of them wrong, I would argue, has become the face of a lot of the inequality we see in the country. But listen, Long Island City was gentrifying before Amazon said it was coming, and Long Island City is still gentrifying today after Amazon said it's not. And I really hope that what comes of this isn't like this moment of, oh, great, we beat Amazon. Now Long Island City is going to go back to what it was, and everything's going to go back to normal. Like, we have hard, tough problems in this country. Tech plays a role. Tech is not solely to blame for that, you know, but we need to like really come together as a society, as a city, and like figure those things out. And I don't know what the right answers always are. But, but, but my point is I don't think we're trying to figure it out. What I worry about is, is that we talk about a dual economy, so, we, so that um, there are going to be the jobs that have great advancement potential, that have potential in terms of creating uh, higher incomes for individuals. And then we have the jobs that really are the jobs where nobody really wants to work, in the, but they have to work. And so, uh, and I have a friend who works in the plant, in Amazon plant. In, Sta in Staten and, Island. In Staten Island. And so he doesn't know what he's telling me. So he'll say, well, I, I uh, counted 1,000 widgets today and I got a, an award. 
What that is saying to me is that the, it is a highly surveilled environment. They have a huge producti productivity requirements for uh, individuals. And for many people who don't have that extra um, ingredient of a good education, once, I go, once again, I go back to buns, guns versus butter, that we do better with one side of that um, equation as opposed to things that are the butter issues, hospitals, schools, et cetera. And so if we're not, and I see this every day in my class. But at the, right, but at, the, but at the same time, you know, you know, the $3 billion in benefits, the $3 billion in benefits were only going to happen when there were multi-billion dollars in tax revenues that were going to come into the city mm -hmm. because of the development. So, and that's, you know, how else are you going to fund all those butter issues? I mean, I think, what you're, I think you're right, but the argument is that a city like New York has to grow in order to keep up. But I mean, growing, yeah, it's right, but growing should be inclusive. It, sh it should include not only those at the top, supposedly, but all, th all those who are going to school to learn so they can achieve. And so I would put forth that we are doing an injustice when we don't necessarily look at those, who, those individuals who are on the ground and are confronted by the, the, the challenges that may, in fact, exclude them from being able to participate. Uh, go ahead. But, you know, I, I, you know better than I do, Julie. I, Amazon was focused on kind of the whole realm of uh, the workforce. And so there was going to be an opportunity for those folks who are um, not able to attain sort of those mid-level jobs. And so, you know, it was not either or, it was both. And I think yeah. that's what we're missing. And I think it was, you know, listen, I thought it was great that there was an activist community that was engaged. I wish it had turned out differently. But, you know, I, I think that someone who works with the private industry a lot, we need the activist community on us, keep right. the private industry on us, like bring, you know, bring us to the table. We need to get there. And well, you can trust that that'll happen yeah, in right. this city. <laughs> I mean, don't, you know, And that... we see, I mean, you're, you're seeing it. Like, let me give you an example of a program currently in New York, uh, in the city. Um, it's not a statewide program. It's called CS for All. It's an $80 million public-private partnership. $40 million is coming from the private sector. Uh, Tech NYC's co-chair, Fred Wilson, is, is on the private side of that. DOE is training over the, the course of 10 years. DOE is training teachers to teach computer science. And at the end of 10 years, there will be computer science education in every city, New York City public school. Um, you know, because these are the jobs of the future. And you've got to, you know, right now, our curriculum and our many of our teachers aren't even trained in the basic skills to teach that. And so there are efforts. And I think that there's a lot of appetite for m more. Um, tech is actually really optimistic. Um, and, and people who work in tech and come to New York really, um, you know, they want to be engaged. They, many of them leave the Valley and come here, myself included, personally, because they want to be part of a city that is more kind of integrated across all of its parts and all of its pieces. They want to be part of something that is bigger and more and different. And well, there is no place more unequal or, or less affordable than Silicon Valley in San Francisco yeah. right now. I mean, so, um, you know, I think that there is, I also think, and this is kind of a political question, is um, you did have the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez as the, the make the road folks, the activist kind of people trying to push the city's politics to the left. This was a behemoth and a not a very um, sympathetic behemoth. It was almost an ideal target. And part of me thinks that they were as shocked as everybody else when Amazon just said, "Yeah, I don't want the heat. Yeah. So The game of chicken, I think you were they, right. They were. It was a game of chicken that they weren't expecting to win that way. And look, New York's to had... To them, it was a negotiation. Yes. And, and you cut us out at the front end, and so we want a little more on the back to make that even. Um, New York's had a series of these fights with tech, and this is at a time when the talk continues to be about how things are rigged, right? And this goes back to Uber and Airbnb having fights with, with the mayor, who they basically rolled. This time, the mayor sided with the big tech company and ended up rolled again. But there is this question, finally, the activist energy was bigger than it should be in comparison to everything else. I'm confident that like the tech community and the business community are going to respond and like organize and, and have their own interests in order going forward is, is my, my but guess. Won't, but, but won't that organizing, and maybe you're better to answer this, won't that organizing involve better community involvement? I think so. Yeah. It I will. Think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, so. I mean, <laughs> isn't that the kind of, yeah. you know, there was an, certainly an appearance of an arrogance 
in saying, you must love me because I am willing to come here, actually, which we don't handle very well I, as New York. I think there was good community <laughs> involvement. I think that it was hard to get the message across. I, so I, I don't want to say, the, I think, yes, there will be better, there will be mm -hmm. more, but there actually was community involvement. It was just quiet meetings, behind the scenes meetings. With people it wasn't having to sign non, non-disclosure agreements. I I mean, even after so. that, though, and you saw you saw it after the deal fell apart. You saw the people who had been meeting with them then came out and were like, "Oh my God, you know what what happened?" You saw the folks from the Nitra residents who would who really cared. Well, about because it. polls Hector showed, even in Queens, changed. even yep. in that area, that people supported the project yeah, by seventy percent. And you they did have like, this, right? You know, I mean, there's you should never underestimate you should never underestimate the effectiveness of a small, committed, skilled cadre of activists. So, I mean, that's. You know, that's kind of how a lot of politics moves in this city. Yeah. I, well, as I said before, it, it, is, it, it is somewhat unusual that a behemoth like Amazon turns around based on pushback from the community. I mean, there are not many uh, uh, journal articles in the Journal of American Planning that tout that kind of thing. <laughs> so it is very well, unusual. And this is part of the reason why it's frankly, it's such a shame for New York. While, at the, at the very outset, the first question you asked me about why tech companies would want to come here, the fundamentals were strong, the fundamentals remain strong. But the truth is about a tech company is y you can do it from other places. It is, you know. Yeah, but is, is this but is this a story of tech companies wanting to go or is it sui generis to Amazon? Was Amazon a particularly, we'll never one, for one of another term, you know, bad and sensitive actor. I mean, is, is, there a, is there a broader lesson or is this just unique that Amazon refused to put up with anybody There's questioning them? Tipping point or breaking point at which people will go elsewhere who want to be in New York. But as you were saying, the talent pool here is so vast. Like we have more PhDs, as Mayor Bloomberg liked to say, than there are people in San Francisco. So vast, the companies are itching to come here and they're willing to deal with the high land price, the difficult politics, and all of these other elements. To get the talent of the people in this city. So, yes, so I do think what happened with Amazon is sui generis, and the important thing is that the people who don't have those talents or jobs are benefiting from this set of arrangements in terms of schools, infrastructure, hospitals, and, and, and the quality of, of living here, because otherwise you do have just a, a luxury or gated or separate city the, the breeds resentment. I don't think that has to be the case. I think Amazon just misplayed this badly. I mean, I, you know, there is a premium cost to, uh, to locating in New York City, and there's People huge pay. premium benefits that come from being. Uh, if anybody wants to ask questions, please do uh, go over to the microphone. Um, when we look, why was Hudson Yards so relatively quiet with so much of a larger benefit, you know, so many larger benefits, such a, such a mammoth project. Because the benefits were public, which is why nobody thought of that comparison until the Times figured out it would make a good headline and then back wrote a story to fit. One, because it's been the dream of the Central Business District literally for 100 years to develop the area. Three, because nobody was living there. Um, so it's much easier to do. And four, because Bloomberg and Dan Doktoroff shot out to, to Alphabet Google Worlds, the their Deputy Olympic Mayor scheme, the time, right. mm. which was going to use sports as, as, as the, the cover to develop that area. When that fell apart, I think that it sort of exhausted. That was the West Side Stadium, the home of the Jets that never existed. Ex exhausted right. the opposition and concern. And in this weird way, like, like Giuliani insulting the board of uh, 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 the Department of Education, let's, let's uh, the next mayor, Bloomberg, end up controlling it, that, that when it finally happened, it's just like, okay, it was also a different political time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, very much so. If, Am, if everything Amazon had been one year earlier, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I think it would have been different. And, and the Hudson Yards is to me just just like appalling and unpleasant and uninteresting in a number of ways. But it it literally has employed like a generation yes. of workers, like the people who built that, and it's been like a city within the city going up. And those are good jobs. Good jobs. Like that's that's been an incredible thing. I think we should have a pied de terre tax and other things, but, but you also had to see that. But you also had the city essentially financing in the extension of the number 7 line, collecting money back by the increased property value. In other words, there was an investment and you were and you were getting money back. That's how these deals are supposed to work. That's the way they should work. And um, that would have happened in Long Island City had Amazon That's located right. In what way? Let me explain when you say well, it would have happened. Well, well, there would have been investment into the infrastructure. There were talks about schools and transportation. 
A school was in the deal. Right, the school right, was actually right, in right. the deal. And, and that's not even, you know, 25,000 jobs was the baseline. They were talking right. about 40, and economists largely agree on this multiplier effect, and, mm -hmm. you know, there's some different there differing opinions on what the numbers actually are, but for high-tech jobs, the idea is there are about five knock-on jobs, additional jobs that come to the neighborhood. They're not all necessarily, you know, they're all different kinds of jobs, but that's the kind of economic activity that keeps place is vibrant and that makes it so people can live there. Let me, let me try to tell us your name and your campus, please. Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Justin Freeman. I'm from uh, LaGuardia Community College. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, or rather, I live in a gentrifying area of the city and I feel like New York is becoming like a place less for New Yorkers and more for people outside of the city. And I'm wondering if we're willing to, um, you know, take on Amazon as a company uh, instead of, because what's essentially happening, I feel like we're becoming more like a San Francisco in a sense, where um, we're gentrifying everybody, everybody's being kicked out, and also we're not uh, necessarily tending to the underserved. And also, as the second question is, um, the 70% of the people that are, you know, that approve of Amazon, are they cognizant of the fact that they're clamoring over a small amount of jobs, and some of these jobs, they might not necessarily have the skills to do but these. Uh, I mean, go ahead. You want to? Well, I, um, I think, first of all, gentrification is a very uh, complex issue because no one wants to live in a dump. Uh, but the way that I see it, and my uh, thinking can be very simplistic, I think, possibly, is that there are two kinds of communities that we, are, that we take on or build in America, places that people don't want to live in and places where people can't afford to live in. And so um, I think that the gentrification is real. And I think that I don't think enough attention is given to building places for everyday people, uh, middle, middle income people, and et cetera. And um, I think um, your um, question is spot on. Can I say one quick? Yeah. I'll be quick on this one. First of all, something that we only, we talk briefly about the new seven train uh, station, but something we haven't talked about more broadly is public transit and the MTA. And when there's this talk of New York's becoming like San Francisco, as someone who lived in San Francisco and happily left and came back to New York, um, you know, I think one of the most, if not the most fundamental difference is that we have public transit. And there's a lot of improvement to be done toward public transit. I'm not, but but the fact that we even have it fundamentally changes changes the outcome because it means that there is literally just more space to build and live and be able to commute. The problem in San Francisco and in the Valley is you can't get around and then you can't afford to live near your work and unless you have a car and you know the traffic the the math just doesn't add up. Um, to your second question which I don't even think we we never were told what the jobs actually were even going to be. We never got that far um, and I again I know that Amazon felt I felt a lot of us felt like we were looking we were hopeful, and now it seems like maybe we were naive, but we were hopeful that there would be a longer conversation. What are the jobs? What do we have to do to make sure that New Yorkers get access to those jobs, get the training they need to get those jobs? And let's, let's it was going to be a 12 to 18 month process. Like, let's get there, but we didn't yeah. get there. Quickly, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, you know, Jamaica, Queens is a community that is in revitalization. There are 5,000 residential units in the pipeline, and most of them are affordable. Right, and that's uh, how important is the fact that land in in Jamaica is much less expensive than land elsewhere. In that's the city. what makes a difference. That's why affordable housing developers can purchase land and build those projects. So, um, yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Yasmina Sharif. I'm from York College, and I have a question, especially for Julie. For so, Jamaica, it's from, it's from you know, there is from a York. question in it. Uh, we have a we're learning a uh, learning process with what happened with Amazon. So, what are Large, uh, large companies, especially tech, going to take from this, um, especially when coming to New York? Is it more yeah. about uh, easing it in, as we see with Google, <laughs> with you know slower yeah. community engagement, or? So I, th I think, I think it's a really good question. I think to some extent we'll see, and I think to some extent we'll never know, which is to say it's really hard to prove a negative. So we will see companies continue to grow here for the reasons we've talked about today, that all the great things that make New York, New York. I think what we'll probably uh, potentially lose out on is the kind of next big bet, if you will, but we'll also probably never know um, what that is that we're missing out on. Um, 
But I think you've already seen tech companies start to engage more with Well, right. So maybe the issue is not the next big bet. Maybe it's the better. Maybe it's the next better who's going to who's going to learn from this. I mean, there were, you know, there were these mistakes that Amazon made. If, you know, if if you're advising somebody who wants to come to New York, what do you tell them? So I think this this was the one time warning and that the tech giants are going to adjust. I also think, and this may not be an issue for the city or the state necessarily, that the tech giants have been giants for a very long time. The, they've continued to sell the myth of like a guy in a garage and anyone could do that. But when guys have garages, what they dream about and what ends up happening if they really hit is that one of these companies buys them and absorbs their product, which is not the same thing. And there is a point at which government needs to come into conflict more directly with these, uh, with these companies. And I think you're seeing the political will for that nationally and locally build up. I think that's a healthy thing. In the last iteration, and I go back to Uber here, you just sort of had companies making up like, hey, these previous laws don't apply to us. And while this is getting litigated in court, we're just going to expand everything as rapidly as we can. The world's changing. Who knows? Same with it with, uh, with, Air, with Airbnb. And th that's unhealthy. Saying we're going to move in here and, and then it's, it's announced as a done deal. But over the next year to 18 months, we'll start negotiating like what community things and benefits we might do. That's unhealthy. So I think even if the people on one side of this pushed harder than they, they might have wanted to and the result wasn't healthy, that over time having a fierce, a competitive competition about what is and isn't okay and the terms that we want to live in in our city and how streets work, um, where the hotels are and people can stay, th those sorts of questions. I think that this is over time a very good development all around. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Tali Wegg. I go to Queens College. And my question is, in this whole process of talking about bringing big tech into New York City and making New York City a more tech-focused um, urban area, do you think that in the future, kind of after this whole Amazon deal, New York should focus more, continue to focus on bringing more industries in or try to kind of develop it more from the ground up, focus on our own startups and bringing um, New York City industry from the ground up, I guess? Well, there's a major incubator yeah. structure throughout New York City. I mean, you go to places like the Brooklyn Army Terminal in Sunset Park where... We have over 7,000 startups in New York. There are a lot, there are a lot of, but... Is it the city's job to do that? I mean, I mean, I think you think, I would assume you think the answer is I yes. I think the answer is yes, absolutely. Right. It is and why? Answer. Well, because, you know, to, to be able to, you, you want big and small, yeah. and you want your homegrown to be able to grow into companies that will stay here and that really understand these communities much better. And we actually thought that, you know, part of what was so exciting about Amazon is that what you do when you bring the big companies is the big companies, they do training, they attract really high skilled people and eventually what you want to happen is that those people leave the company start their own companies here so you got someone who's a young engineer at Amazon they get some training she leaves hopefully it's a she because we need more of those and she builds her next company she starts here and she hires New Yorkers and like that's this kind of like traditional ecosystem and that's what the Valley's been incredibly successful at um, and New York is catching up but you know yeah but the Valley has been very successful at that but a lot of the line workers, the minimum wage workers, the low wage workers can't afford to live there. So, I mean, how, you know, are you eating your seed corn by just by pricing everybody out of the out of being able to live there? So, so. the older tech companies, we'll use HP as an example, they were manufacturing companies. And that's part of why they're in the valley is because there's space there to do that. And manufacturing work demands a much wider range of incomes within the company, not the, 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 the spinoff or knockoff jobs. One of the, the issues with the tech giants now is outside of very highly skilled and really impressive workers, most of the remaining jobs are sort of a, a secondary service class who often aren't directly employed by them and are in a, a very dependent relationship in a lot of ways. And it's difficult to bridge from one to the other. And there's a lot of talk about STEM training in schools, but there are limits to Science, that. Science, technology, engineering, and that. Because, because schools aren't just employment laboratories. And then there's also talk about universal basic income, which I, I think is actually like apocalyptic dystopian stuff. <laughs> but, yeah. but having government and citizens compete with tech to say, what are you doing for the broader society? And forcing them to offer credible, not just advertising answers, is going to be very good for big tech and for citizens yeah. and for us. I'd like to make a quick plug for why New York is so great for tech. Like, a lot of the next generation of tech companies are not just pure tech companies. They're retail tech companies. They're advertising tech companies. They're finance tech companies. And they all require other 
other roles to people who understand those other things. So it's not just the like the the core STEM STEAM jobs, but also like marketing, sales. Yes, ma'am. Tang and I'm from Baruch College, and um, I understand like the aspect with like more job opportunities, but how would we keep Amazon accountable with like providing actual jobs for people within the community or just within New York City and also like taking into account like people across the U.S. like trying to compete. For well, one would assume that, you know, some jobs would obviously be for people kind of kind of emigrating into the city from from anywhere else. And I can't imagine that there wouldn't have been a lot of jobs for for New Yorkers. I mean, we do have a talent pool and um so, I mean, I, I just can't imagine that that wouldn't be the Well, I mean, the thing is that, once again, I emphasize is, is the preparation and training for those jobs. And, and as I have said before, um, making sure that our schools prepare our kids for these uh, kinds of jobs. And I would definitely agree that tech is the thing. I mean, it's the, the thing that, that um, does make the difference because that's where the nation, the economy is going. where the economy is going. going. And, I, and I just pray that the students that I, I stand before each day will be able to grasp onto that, that, that ray of hope and opportunity. Um, and just let me, I want to say something about the transportation. The thing that is interesting about the transportation in New York City, especially in terms of uh, uh, the uh, transit subways and et cetera, in many ways they are very Manhattan-centric. And so when you live in the outer boroughs, like where I live in the Bronx, you can almost pray that, you can almost say that on the weekends you're going to have difficulty getting around. So yes, That's we, the case for people who live in Manhattan too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but for certainly, right. I yes. can certainly yes. say that there's going to be um, track work, because I keep saying, well, when do they ever finish that, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be one of the, the reasons. So I think we also have to think of not only about sometimes food deserts, but transit deserts. Yeah. And so... Um, the mayor has, I think, spoken quite eloquently. And, and so uh, that also plays into the quality of life. Okay. I just wanted to say that. Yes, sir. Hi, how are you guys? Um, my name is Timothy Jarrell. I'm from your college. Um, my question is for um, Ms. Hope Knight. Around our school in Jamaica, the neighborhood is changing. Um, you know, there's, as you know, there's construction everywhere. Business is going up and out of business. Um, my question is, why does low-income wages stay the same during urban gentrification when all other values rise, such as um, housing and, like, food prices and rent and all that it's other stuff? So uh, thank you for your question, and uh, I, I hear where you're coming from. You know, the issue, and we, we just spoke about this, is trying to attract major business in the beginning of the uh, revitalization cycle is very difficult. And so, um, you know, what happens is you have uh, retail that comes into the community. Those tend to be lower wage jobs. You don't have um, big employers that are supporting this gentrification revitalization. And so, you know, it's unfortunate that it's probably 10 years away until we're able to attract a big anchor company that would provide the kind of wages that you were trying to seek. But that's sort of the cycle of revitalization. That cycle, uh, which does take years. I mean, you've been planning, I mean, the people at the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation for decades now have been planting those seeds. And those seeds have sprouted. I mean, there's a lot of you know, if you were in Jamaica 20 years ago, you know, you can go and see the housing, see the, see the, you know, hotels. I mean, there are now hotels going up in, in, in Jamaica. But that's a long term. It's a you know, Amazon's a little different in the sense it's kind of like Hudson Yards in that it's like a, a huge place that's being created all at, all at once. When there is something, well, but that was, I don't want to use the word organic, but you know, there is something about slowly building but, up. But the community. residential was, was already They had rezoned yeah, Western Queens about exactly. 20 years that's ago. And that was actually, that's, that's what you're right. talking about, right? That's that was the about. lag. That's right. That's and right. they came, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Junaid, I'm from Brooklyn College. So my question is, uh, you said the governor supported Amazon and uh, the mayor supported it and the community. So why didn't the activists, uh, what were their demands, basically? Harry, that's yours. Yeah. <laughs> well, Look the deal was worked out in secret, so there was no community support or answer initially. When the response came, it was loud and very upset. 
And because whatever combination of the mayor, the governor, and Amazon was incompetent, they didn't have polling, they didn't set up the way for this, and the politicians who were cut out encouraged people to, uh, to sort of go on in that register. So getting some sense of where like the baseline of opinion was at took a long time. Additionally, that baseline can be a bit overhyped because if you have 30% of the city and you know 20% of the people in the neighborhood are gonna vote on this issue and 70 or 80% who maybe don't vote and if they're gonna vote, it's not really about this issue, we feel the other way. Those aren't quite apples to apples, even if it is an indicator of where, you know, as a yes or no question, uh, the public is at. Let me ask you a question, but just since we're talking politics, which of course I love to do, mm -hmm. um, I had the strong sense in watching this, I was not involved in any way, that the governor was driving the bus and the mayor was just kind of yeah. going along with it. I mean, it's like the one time he works with the, with the governor, he gets burned. So, I mean... And the mayor, the mayor was like, before this, he's like, I won't shop on Amazon. I don't think it's healthy for local retail, personally, right? He'd really been on the other end. And, and again, he did not have any set-aside subsidies for them. This was definitely the governor's deal. And both of them thought, this is 25,000 jobs at least, maybe 40 to 50. It's the largest economic development ever. project yeah. in, the history of the, in the history of the state. Yes, although it's a fraction of the jobs that we've generated in a typical year. Just to, to bear that in mind, New York's a really big place. But this, this was too big a deal to say no to. This was going to have obvious benefits. Um, but they, they did not do this fade work. And again, the elections, by the way, the change things were not a secret. They were actually held in public. There were news reports about them. Like, like they had time to discuss how to roll this out and how to make this work. And, and the company as well. Um, and de Blasio, to his credit, when they backed out, he said, well, we were happy to have them as a neighbor. We didn't offer them anything else. And I, I spent a lot of time knocking the guy. I think he was right about this. And if they can't accept those terms, good riddance. Well, Instead of saying good riddance, let me just say goodbye. We're about to run out of time. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. On thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.